Welcome to the Chronically Healthy Life Show. When you hear the word chronically, do you automatically associate it with chronic disease? We all do. It's been programmed right into us. But what if we flip that whole idea on its head? Let's discover how we can create chronic health in our bodies, our minds, our finances, our relationships, and of course, in our lives. Let's jump right on in. I'm Andy, and joining me is my life partner in all things, Minna. So we took a few days um, vacation to Cancun, and how was your experience? It was fun. You know, sometimes it's just something that you need to relax, to chillax a little bit, to rest the mind, rest the body, and just rest in general. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it's just to get away from all the chores, the dishwashing, feeding cats, and whatnot, just to say, get out of the house and not have to cook for a while. So agreed. So agreed. <laughs> so what's our topic this week, you know, to kick off the show. Well, we talked to some couples during our trip in Cancun, so let's talk about that, you know? Yeah, I think that would be interesting. So um, we took a trip to Cancun and, you know, we met a lot of people and uh, it was interesting as we're meeting people, seeing couples and stuff, that it became very obvious that not all couples are aligned in their goals for retirement. So we went to a all-inclusive adult-only resort. 21 over. 21 over. So we, you don't see any kids. So the people that go there is either like a honeymooners or they are doing uh, retiring. You know, they, as a couple, as a retired couple, they can spend time vacationing together or you know, another couple, and maybe they just... Winding down. Winding almost down or they're at, mm -hmm. becoming empty nesters. That, that's when they actually have the time to go to your adult-only resort. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, I, I think, you know, it'll be sort of interesting to share some of the things that we notice uh, when couples don't share, uh, when their, their goals aren't aligned for retirement and, and what that may look like. I mean, we talked about couples being aligned throughout their entire relationship, basically. You need to align about what your, your, your career should look like as, mm -hmm. as a couple, what your family situation is going to look like retirement is no different i mean if you if i see myself as someone that goes to travel the world you know after i retire and you see someone that is going to just stay put and i don't know take care of your your cat kid cats <laughs> that that's a very really different vision so you, you know as a couple you need to work things out as a as a re, your retirement plan oh for sure and i i think it comes down to depending on your vision um What's it going to take financially also? And are you the type that has to be around friends or family? Or can you just let it all go and start over, right? Yeah, because retirement really is a major life transformation, right? Mm -hmm. It's the time that you actually leave your 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 life behind, leave your work behind. You're actually starting someone new as a older person. And, you know, starting a new phase in life when you're like 60s or maybe even 70s. It could be a challenge. Exactly. And, you know, when we're in Cancun, we, of course, we got some that shared the same vision of traveling the world, you know, that, you know, they said, oh, we're finally empty nesters. We're just hitting different areas. Or maybe it's just a matter of ticking off bucket list of travel places, right? Things to do before you get too old and too wobbly to do anything. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they're just there to chillax like we were, right? Just unwind and reset our minds to see what's going to be moving forward, right? Right, and your retirement plan will really depend on your family situation mm -hmm. and your financial situation, right? I mean, if you're grandparents with 16 grandkids, you probably want to stay a little more, you know, stay put and take care of your kids sometimes. But, you know, if you are freelance like us, you just want to travel the world. There are couples that just live off these world cruises. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, right? yeah. We, they we, they we, just yeah. travel on a cruise and they never, they, they don't even have a home name. That. That's what they do on a boat. Yeah, because he said it's just so much easier not worrying about taxes and rent and all the meals are planned for them. And they just wake up in the new city or, you know, new place every day almost, right? Which is such a pretty good, I think it's a pretty good living. But, you know, why do you think it's so important for couples to share the same vision even for retirement? Because sometimes people can't even seem to share the same vision in investments. Well, yeah, I mean, that's a problem, right? Um, 
what for one thing when you retire your financial situation changes mm -hmm. so you do have to plan out your next 30 40 50 years however long your retirement is going to be and how you're going to spend that 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 money that you have or sometimes you you know you may want to downsize your your, your living and move to a cheaper place to, to live you may want to do have um a, a part-time job or some like residual earnings of some kind to subsidize your fin finances of course and i i think you know it, it's, it's always interesting some people think that retirement you'd be either lying on the beach or you're just sitting watching tv all the time um maybe you choose to find something to continuously do because it can be really boring it's not about just subsidizing your money but keeping your mind alive keeping something having uh, passion and doing something you love. You can still continue to do that while you're retiring, um, but maybe you can do it in a, a smaller scale and helping things along where you're retiring it. I know that a lot of people, that especially those that are working really hard right now, they're going to say, when I retire, I'm going to do nothing. Now, when you do nothing, you're actually doing something. You kind of have to figure out what that do nothing actually means. It could be just reading a book or go swimming or do I don't know, watch TV or do... So you're actually doing something with you, nothing. You're just not working, working. And, and that's so true. And one of the things that I notice um, that a lot of people don't think about because they're always talking about retirement. Someday we're going to make enough money. Someday the kid's going to uh, move out and we'll be empty nesters. Someday when we have enough money um, or, or we don't have to take care of parents or whatever, but... That's someday they're planning all this, but they're not taking care of their health. How many people that we see there that was like, you know, hobbling around? This is an all-inclusive resource. Everything's planned for you, and yet they couldn't even really enjoy everything because they're either walking around the cane to being pushed around in a wheelchair or something. You know, that's something that I think couples should really think about retiring, to, you know, into their later years too about their health, right? Yeah, I mean, health expenses, uh, medical expenses. Is probably one of the bigger expenses um, during your retirement. That that's how the financial planners tell you that you need to set aside this much money because you are going to be sick. You're going to have to pay for surgeries and medical bills and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So if you manage to actually stay healthy and stay away from paying paying for the med most medical bills, you're actually a lot better off. But for you to be healthy in your retirement, it takes years and years of planning. Exactly. And typically, you need to, the earlier you start, the better, because usually once your health starts going downhill, before you start thinking about your health, then it's a little harder to plan for that. Because like Minna says, a lot of the money then will be going towards health challenges that could be going towards your retirement. For sure. I mean, I watched my mom getting actually really sick, even though she's not really sick. She's just not healthy. You know, she's always in the bed. She is tired, headaches, dizzy, all sorts of sickness that's not really a, a big sickness but you're just not well enough to move around and not well enough to travel and that was when i was a teenager so she's only in the 50s yeah i remember that and you know they are retired in the 50s so they they financially they do okay but they can't re really enjoy it for the next 30 40 years they just you know not a whole lot to do as a retired couple but one more fun tip you know <laughs> Assuming everyone's going to be healthy into the hundreds, but what if you find you just don't have enough money, that magical number in your head to retire? Because some people need, think they need millions to retire. What is one of the hacks that people can do to retire somewhere if they don't have enough? Just say if you're living in California and it takes probably 10 million to retire, what's a quick tip that you can do? Well, there's a term called geo arbitrage. Or, or arbitrage. Geo which means the retirees are relocating to areas that has a lower cost of living, lower standard of living, and a better quality of life, right? And we see a lot of expats nowadays moving to somewhere in South America or to Portugal, Spain, or some to Thailand, Vietnam. Those places are great. They have great air, great clean food, clean air, and the standard of living is only a fraction of what we see here in the United States. And that's one, one way to stretch your money a lot further than, than you are here. Exactly. So retiring early may not be as far as you think. Depending on where you live, you may be just able to just cash out your house and you can retire, work on a smart job on the beach and live happily ever after. 
that well, I guess that would be our plan. <laughs> That's our plan. That's what we're working on. So, you know, those are the things I think that couples need to think about for retirement because a lot of people, they're way too late to think about that. Like Minna says, it's great to plan ahead. So let's take a break. And when we come back, we're going to have the back Kids Corner. And we have a special guest for you today. See you there. All right, strap in, folks. We're about to take a joy ride through the fountain of youth. It's Annie Nam from Chronically Healthy Life. Ever wonder why some folks seem to age like fine wine, while others are more like a mochi cheese that's been forgotten in the back of the fridge? It's like they got the energy of a Duracell bunny on Red Bull, while the rest of us are running on fumes. Now, you might think hitting the gym and munching on kale is the ticket to eternal youth, but sometimes it feels more like we're just speeding up the aging process. Picture this, you're on the treadmill, feeling like a million bucks, and suddenly you look down and realize your knees sound like a bag of popcorn in the microwave. Not exactly the sound of youth, am I right? But fear not my friends, because here's the kicker. It's not just about the number of candles on your birthday cake, it's all about those sneaky little stem cells playing hide and seek inside your body. At the age of 20, you got more of these bad boys than you can shake a stick at. But fast forward a few decades, and they're as scarce as a parking spot in downtown Manhattan. But guess what? We got a secret weapon up our sleeves. Phototherapy patch technology without drugs. That's right, folks. With our stem cell activation patches, you can hit the rewind button on aging faster than you can say reverse aging. So if you're ready to reclaim your youth, look younger, feel stronger, and heal faster than a superhero with a side of espresso, then it's time to hop on board the rejuvenation train. Schedule your free consultation now at calendly.com backslash the foolish couple backslash stem cells. And let's make aging look like yesterday's news. It's not anti-aging, it's reverse aging, baby. For Kids Corner this week, we're going to talk about stimulating kids' creativity. So with very young children, this is pretty easy to do. Number one thing you can do is read to your kids. Let them hold the pages, let, get those books that have the the feely, the things they can feel, the bright colors, those are all really, really good for stimulating imagination and creativity. And when you stimulate those kinds of ideas, you're also stimulating their intellect to grow. It's really critical. The next most important thing you can do is play with them. Do puzzles, uh, color, finger paint with them. If they like if they like to build with things like Legos, build with them. If you're not good at it, don't worry about that. Let them be better than you and, and let it be okay because then you're also teaching them that it's okay to just have fun and not be worried about being perfect all the time. Another great way to stimulate their creativity, imagination, and intellect is the simple act of cooking with them when they're old enough, of course. Uh, bring them in the kitchen and let them help prepare meals. It can be as simple as tearing lettuce or uh, it doesn't have to require a knife like cutting carrots or something like that, but it can be simple. And as they get older, of course, you can add in more advanced things. That way you are you are helping them. It's real life. They're engaged. They're having fun. They're off screen. And it's uh, also bonding for you with your kids. It's a win-win for both you and your kids. Ciao for now. Welcome back to the Chronically Healthy Life Show. Um, on today's segment, we have a special guest. Her name is Gretchen Heidel, and I hope I pronounced your name correctly, Gretchen. You um, and she is considered by many to be one of Los Angeles's top coaches. Gretchen Heidel is a master certified coach through the International Coaching Federation, a certified mentor coach, mesmerizing keynote speaker, 
and of course, an engaging workshop facilitator. She specializes in helping individuals, organizations, and coaches make life-changing transformations by breaking free of the rules and secrets that hold them back from living their most powerful lives. Her coaching and wisdom helps people create new identities based on their strengths and step into their best lives, achieving life-changing success both personally and professionally. She specializes in helping coaches learn the art of building a successful coaching practice through service instead of cheesy sales tactics. <laughs> so Gretchen is the author of the book, Break Free from Your Dirty Little Secret, uh, A New You and 10 Secret Breaking Stages. Beautiful. And it's dedicated to helping women break free from the shame of their secrets to step into bigger living. Welcome to our show, Gretchen. Thank you for having me, Anna and Mina. It's nice to be with you. It's very nice to have you here. So Gretchen, tell us what inspired you to write this book about dirty little secrets? You know, it's such a good question. And I'm so glad that you asked it. For me, I always knew that I was a writer. And there was a day that I was walking in the park and I really felt God saying to me, okay, Gretchen, you're going to write this book. You're the person to write this book and this is what it's going to be. And God kind of showed me what these 10 stages were going to be. There's a Mexican food restaurant right across the street from the park. I texted my husband. I said, meet me for tacos. And we talked about the book and I really felt like now was the time to write a book like this because of all of the coaching that I've done and just seeing what limited lives both men and women were living due to their mindset, due to the secrets of the mind. And I really felt that I had an answer for it. Can you give us an example of what those limits look like? Sure. You know, well, I think the first thing that probably is important to talk about is what is a secret? Because that will really help to show what the limits are. And the truth is that secrets aren't just about the thing that you've done. You know, so many people, it's like, oh, I stole the grapes at the grocery store without paying for them and ate them by the time I get to the checkout counter. Or I scratched that car by accident when I opened my door. Or maybe a bigger secret. I lied on my resume. I had an abortion. I was unfaithful, whatever that might be. But that's just the first part of a secret. The real secrets where the limits come in are the things that we believe to be true about who we are. Things like, I didn't really deserve to be born, or I'm a fraud. I'm not good enough. People are going to find out the truth about me. I'm angry. I'm passive aggressive. I'm fill in the blank that that's really where our biggest secrets derive from. And so when you're saying what are the limits, it's those narratives that we give to ourselves because of the things we've done and the things that we've thought. And so that's the piece that I was really interested in helping people break free from. So I, I heard you say, you know, that the one of the examples says that you, I keep telling myself, I'm a fraud. Um, how does that, is, is that really a secret though? Like, you know, it, it's, I almost feel like someone, you know, when I feel like I'm a fraud, someone is telling you, you look like a fraud. <laughs> Sometimes, yes, but mostly think about it. If we just met and I asked you about you, you would not want to tell me that you feel like you're a fraud. That wouldn't be how you led. You wouldn't be like, Gretchen, it's so nice to meet you. You know, I feel like I'm a fraud about 80% of the time when I'm on the show, when I'm out there in the world, you wouldn't lead that way. And so anything that we feel like we want to hide or we don't want other people to know those are secrets. And so that's the sneaky part. I'm really glad that you brought it up because it's the little nuances of secrets and our secret thinking, our ideas about who we are that end up causing the most damage in our life. So how does keeping these, you know, these secrets, you know, drain women of their power, you know, at least according to your experience as a coach, because, you know, this book is all about helping women break free from their secrets, right, from their shame. Yeah. You know, so the way that secrets drain people of their power is if you think about it, let's say that you're having the secret about a lie that you told and it caused a lot of damage in somebody else's relationship. 
you would be carrying around that piece that then says you're no good people mm -hmm. can't trust you and you wouldn't go for higher relationships so you might attract some people into your life that really aren't that good for you you might decide that you can't go for job opportunities because you're not good enough or you're this kind of a person and when we think about that with really helping women to harness their power and to step into who they are living as clean as you can with the truth about who you are is always going to be the way to do that but when we're faced with these ideas and these half truths we live in this faulty narrative and kind of the secondhand living where we're not living to our full potential because we're not standing in the power of who we really are so you know from from my understanding it sounds like you're conditioning your life with the secrets that you're trying to hide then right yeah you know it's like life has conditioned you and so the way to think about it is this we all have an operating system you know our own personal operating system kind of like a phone and we have been installed by these narratives and beliefs and ideas labels about who we are and the way that we're supposed to behave in the world to receive our love like value love and belonging and in order to do that we often become secret keepers so if i have an idea that the world is a scary place i might then decide that i need to be bigger than or maybe i need to be a people pleaser whatever that is but it becomes my operating system and the only way that i can see life so the results that i create are then perfect for that operating system mm. but when you shift it just a little bit by unveiling these secrets, even three to 5% with your perspective shift, life changes and so does your operating system. I love that idea because we're all so attached to our phones and our lives revolve around that. And like you said, now we're using our secrets to lock in what we're gonna see in our lives. That's it, that's it. So Gretchen, do you feel like women and men keep different secrets or do they keep them differently? Ooh, this is a great question. So here's what I found because I've done the work, even though it's a pretty pink cover and it looks like it's just based towards women. I do this book with a lot of men too. They'll send me pictures like selfies of them in bed reading the book. But here's the thing. Even though the outsides are different, the way we feel about ourselves is often the same, be it male or female. You know, these ideas of somehow that we're lacking and that's a secret that everybody has and so the way that we keep them might be different but i don't know that it's necessarily based on being male or female i think it's more personality type mm -hmm. that you know if you're someone who's been raised a certain way in this bucket you probably keep secrets in one way if you're someone that's been raised another way maybe you're quieter about your secrets so it really i haven't noticed it being a more male or female orientation as much as just the way that you were raised Hmm, interesting. I, I, I always thought that there would be a difference. I, I always thought that women tends to play it safer in a way. So I, I don't want to overstate you know, achievements. I want to keep a little secret of uh, how maybe how good I am or something. Um, so that, that was actually not the case at all. Yeah, well, and you know, this is interesting of what you're bringing up. So some women have really been conditioned to be people play pleasers and to play it safe. Sometimes it's based on culture. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's based on if you were raised and it was be polite, be a caretaker. Um, in some cultures and for some women, it's rude if you show all of your achievements. And then in other cultures, and for some women, it's the only way to get to the quote unquote top. And so it's not necessarily a male or female issue. Again, it's what were you raised with as the narrative of the way that you were supposed to maneuver the world. But I like that you brought that up. That, that, that is true. That, that sort of, that, you know, I'm thinking about that a little bit and it sort of blows my mind because you know, I always thought that men was going to just spin off that secret and make it more grander design than, you know, making that small lie a big lie to make them, you know, to to uh, make their their meagle bigger. Right. You know, and uh, yeah. it, it's interesting that um, that you say that it, it really just depends on um, their, their their lies, how they're brought up. So, yeah, you know, I, I thought for sure it'll be slightly different how men and women 
and know their secrets too. Well, what you what you might see that's different is different times in life. So for a lot of men, some of their secrets will come out during that midlife time when they're starting to feel a little bit unsure of what comes next for them. And so maybe they go out and they buy the big car, or this is the time where they have the affair, or you know, and it's all so cliche, right? But those are the things that are coming up. But underneath that is the secret of not feeling good enough, not feeling like they've done enough for life to matter. And so the way that they might do that could present differently. But I've seen a lot of women at the same time in life going out and doing those same types of things. Maybe they're not buying a car, but they're buying the Prada purse or whatever mm -hmm. it might be. And, and it's the same, but it's to cover up that idea of, is this it? And for most people, that's the biggest secret there is that somehow they didn't live up to it all. It wasn't enough. They were made for more and have no idea what that is, and they fell short. So do we always know what this dirty little secret of ours is? Not always, that they're insidious, you know? So it's easy to think of the actions, right? Like we all know some of the things that we've done that it's like, yep, I'd rather nobody know that I did that particular thing. But the secret thoughts are harder, especially when I do this work. Yeah, most of the people that I work with will say, I don't have any secrets. I'm an open book. But the more you start reading that book, the, the more closed it is. And so when we're looking at the narratives, those are the pieces that when we take a look at the way that you speak to yourself, the real thoughts that you have, your biases, the labels that you have on who you are, the labels that you put on others, a lot of times those are secrets. And that's why I created the 10 stages is so that people could very slowly begin to unwind. What is the secret? What is the secret that's bigger than I lied on a resume? What is it the secret thought, the secret feeling that I'm having and how did it get there? So can you run us what those 10 stages look like? I can. I don't know if it's so interesting, but I mean, there are. If we want to, if we want to read them all or not, but I will say this: when we're thinking of your secrets and we're thinking of these ten stages and what's really the part that's the most important, it's calling out your secret, which is stage one, and that's the part where you're going to begin to get some clarity about your secret. In stage two, what we want to do is really begin to unwire the secret. How did it get there in the first place? What was the faulty wiring that you learned as a kid? So in here, there's one of my secrets. And it's about, um, I, I tried to stab my husband in a church when I was feeling very abandoned and unloved. Now that sounds like crazy behavior. I'm a very put together woman. You know, you would never think like, oh, Gretchen's going to go nuts and try to stab her husband. But I had a secret narrative in my head that went back to my faulty wiring that violence somehow was okay. And so when we look at these messages that we got in the way that we were brought up, it's interesting because that always creates the frameworks of how your secrets got there. You know, and then the other stages, it's about the feelings. You know, what are the feelings that you were trying to chase? For me, it was always to matter. You know, really, do I matter? Am I really here? Am I important? For someone else, it's about security. Someone else, it might be love. And then we take a look at the finding our false self. Who are we pretending to be in the world? And we could be so much bigger if we could live in the real us. Mm -hmm. Then we talk about some spirituality because that's really important. We're going to create a secret template. You're going to tell your secret. We're going to look at the pitfalls of where might you still get stuck in secret keeping. And then we're going to get to the place where you get to create a new you and a real new life. So that's where all of these stages come in. And each one is a lot of work. You know, it's an unbecoming. And that's the part that's really important about this work. It's really unbecoming anything that isn't really you, especially the ideas, the narratives and the beliefs that were passed on to you. Be a people pleaser, be accommodating, be a quote unquote good girl. Don't be too loud. Let that person take the last piece of steak. Don't be stuck up. Be skinny. Get a great husband. You know, all of these things that it's like, wow, it's a lot for us to balance. So it feels like a lot of these 
stories is an influence by our parents. Is that right? Us, our, our well-meaning parents, you know, and we love them and our caregivers, because if you think about it, a lot of these things are legacy. So I think about, you know, my grandparents, they came over, they, they escaped from Hungary and they had all of their old ideas with them and they brought them over to America and then they passed them down. But it's kind of like a bad family recipe where you're like, wait a minute, we don't even like this dish. Why are we trying to eat this? This doesn't fit. Nobody wants this. We should have left that in the old country, but it's been brought over on the boat. You're trying to be respectful, but nobody wants it. That 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 is so true. And, you know, it, it was really funny because, uh, you know, uh, uh, to be honest, you know, I read the book, Minute didn't get a chance to read it yet. Yeah. And as I'm reading through here, and it says, like, claim your secret, like, you know, like, acknowledge your secret. And I was just sitting there, like you said, I don't have no dirty little secret. secret. And, and then I'm sitting there writing, thinking, hey, I think I'm going to rewire some of these things. Like, is this how the way I remembered it as it actually mm-hmm. happened? And mm-hmm. it, it, it's sort of interesting going through the book as you dive in a little deeper. Hey, that actually wasn't the way I remembered it, or that's not not the way. Oh, th- I'm doing this because my dad did this, or like you said, your grandfather said that. It's like one of the things that, uh, you know, as as a nutrition coach, you know, of course I'm telling people to eat eighty percent full, but that's not the way my grandfather taught me. My grandfather, because he grew up, you know, in uh, during the war, he says you need to eat everything on your plate, right? Your no plate. way of food, right? But hey, if you do that nowadays, since food is so bountiful, everyone's going to be you know, just overweight and obese, right? Yes, yes. And, you know, when we think about that, secrets really can make us sick. And so you're talking about it in the idea of food. And think of it just in our spiritual and mental fitness Mm -hmm. as well, that if we take on every single thing that's been offered to us, every idea, eat your whole plate. Um, My grandfather, it was there was good questions, bad questions, and stupid questions. So not, and most of them were stupid. Okay. And the biggest currency in our family was intelligence. So we never wanted to be on this side of stupid. So we didn't ask any questions. Well, I wouldn't have been able to be a coach if I wouldn't have learned how to ask questions. But when I started coaching, you can bet that I didn't go around telling people only idiots ask questions. You know, (laughs) that that would not make me, or or if people ask me a question like, well, why don't you already know that? You must be pretty stupid. You know, that that would never work. So that's a secret. But it's all of these different pieces that we look at and it's like, wow, I am carrying around hundreds of these, hundreds. And so when we talk about the unbecoming, do I really think people that ask questions are stupid? No, not at all. Do I think I'm stupid because I ask questions? No, but there you go. And so it's breaking family tradition, which often in itself is so hard and so uncomfortable because then we're getting outside of the family system. So do we need to break out all our secrets in order to break free or is it like a phase approach to this? You know, it's definitely a phased approach. What I ask people to do, my clients especially, and and the readers of the book is take one at a time. And you can either take it from a thought that you have that's really getting in your way. You know, after that part about the near stabbing in the church, I really had this secret that I'm violent. I'm a violent person. That means I'm scary, which means I'm intimidating, which means I can't have any friends, which means I can't be trusted, which means, which means, which which means, you know, just keep following it down. So you can either follow it from a thought or you can follow it from an action, but either way you'll get the same result. And when you're unwrapping one secret, it's amazing how many pieces of so many other secrets show up. So doing one often helps you to heal from many of them just as you're going through the process. So that's good news. That That is so true. So what advice would you give a woman who is struggling with a secret that she's been keeping and, you know, but is finally ready to let it go? Yeah. And this is really important. You have to get support, whether you have a coach, a therapist, maybe a clergy person, a trusted friend, have some support. And you want to make sure that there's structure with your secret as well. And that's why I really broke this down into safe stages for people to be able to go through just a little bit at a time so that it's not overwhelming trying to do it all at once and so that it's complete. So I would say, get a copy of the book, 
maybe even have your friend get a copy of the book, work it together, because that's a great way too to have someone who they're going through the process while you're going through the process and you can do the work at the same time. I have a follow up question on this and this is yeah. this came to my head. Um, we we saw a series, we haven't been watching it, but you're gonna find out that, you know, we like watching rom-coms, at least I do, you know, which okay. is probably weird, okay? But uh, one of the shows, was, was, what's it called? Dirty Little Liars or? Big Little Lies? Big Little Liars, yeah, 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 yeah. So. <laughs> right, and it was sort of funny because it started with a small lie and it just got really yeah. bad. And here you are telling, like, you know, work together to let your secrets out. In real life, does that happen? It can, okay. definitely, in a really supportive way. And that show is, well, it's great. The writers really wrote a great book. Let's look at that for a minute. So each of those characters had their own little huge secret. Some was about domestic violence. Some was about, you know, the woman who was just so perfect, but really on the inside, she's dying. Um, then there's the one that is like the divorcee and, you know, raising the kids single or whatever it is. But the secrets, they were all about how they felt about themselves mm -hmm. and not wanting other people to know. And while in that particular show, it's a book as well, you know, it all just unravels in some crazy ways. But that's the truth of what happens if we don't get control of our thoughts. So imagine instead these women come together and instead of murderers and whatever else is going on in there, they decided to really do some interpersonal work and to go deep and to talk about, I actually hate my marriage. I don't want to have to be perfect. I've put everything on these kids and it's not working out. Underneath that, it's when do I count? When will I be seen? When will it be enough? Mm -hmm. No one would have had to get murdered. It would have been really different. <laughs> like, you know, it would have been really different. And so while most people, thank God, aren't out there murdering others, they're murdering themselves little by little. You know, we strangle ourselves. We strangle the love we have for ourselves and then for others. You know, those were some really catty women in that show. And so we strangle it and we never get to be who we're supposed to be. So in your experience, are there any secrets that is actually better off kept to yourselves? <laughs> This is a good question. So it's not necessarily that it's better off being kept to yourself. Some secrets, though, are better worked through with a therapist rather than with a friend. You know, um, some there's some secrets that feel so big that it might feel dangerous to tell someone in your inner circle or maybe the person wouldn't be able to look at you the same. But telling is really important. And when you have a third party therapist, they've heard they've heard all of it like every single thing. They're not shocked. They're like, yeah, I don't know. But, you know, they keep their face the right way and they're trained in how to say it. So it's very important to do the work, but picking who you're going to share which secret with is equally as important. That's actually one of the stages in the secret breaking system. So if there's someone out there that is really struggling with a big secret that she's been, or he or she has been keeping, but is ready to finally let it go. What do you think is the first step? Get the book. That's the first step. Really get the book because it's going to walk you through. Something else that you can do as well is take a look at what was your motive for keeping the secret in the first place? Was it so that you could feel loved? Was it so that you could feel safe? Who were you people pleasing and what was at stake? Because there was something really important at stake and that's why you kept it. If I'm eating the, gre the grapes at Ralph's and not paying for them, I don't do this by the way, but let's say I was, um, by the time I get there, I don't want to be honest and be like, you know, I, I just ate all of these grapes and I, I feel like a thief because you don't want to tell people that. But big or small, silly or serious, secrets are insidious. And how long would this whole process take to let go of a, a big secret? It depends. It's really different for everyone. And it depends on how ready they are to work this. You know, I take women through a six month program where mm -hmm. we have a retreat at the beginning, a retreat at the end and four months of coaching in between. And it's a very thorough process because of the unbecoming. You're not going to learn all of this in one sitting. And you're definitely not going to learn it all just from reading a book. There's a lot of action and accountability and love that go with it. 
So you said you have uh, like a six month program for yeah. women only or are men allowed or yeah, yes, right now you know. only. However, if I get enough interest from men, I'm going to do one for men too. Currently with the men, I'm doing individual work where they where we get together and do this. For my women, I have a break free to bold program. And that's a six month program where we do it as a group and there's some individual in there as well. But it's a very thorough program and the togetherness in hearing that other women feel the same or have done the same, it's it's so healing on their journey to this breaking free. So how do we know if we have we have finally let it all go and we're free from these dirty little secrets? Yeah, you're going to feel different. You'll notice that your behavior is different. So if you're someone that usually is, um, let's say that you have some real negative self-talk in a certain area, you will notice that after you have worked this through that self-talk isn't there in the same way anymore. What do you think? I'm still trying to figure out what my dirty little secret is. You know, I was like, seriously, I was going to say, I was so afraid you're going to ask, what's my dirty little secret? Because, oh man, I'm going to have to tell my dirty little secret. I mean, I could. I, could. <laughs> I don't know if we have time. <laughs> exactly. So, can you always tell if someone is holding on to a secret? Most of the time, there is a secret that maybe they don't even know that they're holding. So, by the time I've talked to them and done some coaching, it's pretty evident what it is. And I always, respectfully ask permission to kind of go there and to see if that's something that they want to explore. So, you know, we're, we're talking about your book and then your program over six months, you know, uh, what do you hope women take away as a key message or inspiration from reading your book and, mm -hmm. you know, releasing their secrets? Yeah, you're not alone. Women from around the world, over a over hundred women wrote in their secrets. Mm -hmm. And you are not alone. And there is nothing too big that you have done or thought that you can't get freedom from. And wow. you deserve to have freedom. So let me ask you this. After you let go of the old secrets, what if you have new secrets? Right. Okay. Because it's the spider web. And so that's the part. It's totally a spider web. You will have new secrets. And that's why we continue to do the work. And that's why it's six months is because you're going to have one secret. We unpack it. Oh boy, look at the spider webs. This is here, here, and here. And so you continue to do the work. And there's also some um, things in there too, to make sure that you can stop creating secrets. So there's a lot of information in the book on that and in my program about what do I do now? Now that I've told the secret, how do I make sure that I'm no longer a secret keeper? That That's true. Just following up on the question is like, do uh, most of the people that you work with finally get to the point that they are not continuously creating each secrets? Because sometimes that like you said, they may not even know about it, right? Yes. And so once you get, I call it sober thinking, once we're really sober in our thinking and we are making sure that we have committed to this, there's a daily inventory that you do. Did I keep any secrets today? There's body tracking that we do. Cause you know, if you kept a secret, like, oh, mm, here it is in my chest. Oh, my stomach right away. Uh, mm, uh, you know, the whole thing. So you do, you do this inventory. And if there's something you need to tell, then you tell it. And oftentimes too, even just acknowledging, oh yeah, I did keep a secret today. I did do that old behavior. Yep. All right, not going to do that tomorrow is enough, you know, but there's definitely different places just like that to be paying attention to and to take a look at as you're moving forward. That's so awesome. Go ahead. So Gretchen, um, what is the best way for our viewers to reach you if they have if they have secrets to let go? Yeah, they can they can reach out to me on my website. Um, here it is right there popped up and they can email me as well. So they can get your book from the website and everything. If they want to set up a time, they can get everything through your website and through your everything email. Through my, through my website and my email. And then you can also get the book on Amazon. That is so awesome. Well, thank you, Gretchen, for your time. Okay. Um, you know, for us, you know, we're so big into relationships. And I think that's so important to live a chronically healthy life yes. and for you to help women and men break through the secrets to have a better relationships. I, I think that is just amazing work that you're doing to help change your world in that aspect.
I really appreciate it. And thank you so much for having me. And thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you, Gretchen. Thank you. Coming right up, we're going to have the bio hack of the week. Thank you once again for being a guest. Thank you. Hi, everyone. And on this week's biohacking episode, we are going to dive into the world of bone health. And our bones, they support our body. And, you know, we need to maintain the health of our bones if we want to have a vibrant, long, active life, right? So first off, building strong bones, it's probably more of a marathon than a sprint, right? You know, it's, it's something that's going to last for a long time. Things we're going to have to, you know, incorporate into our lifestyle. And, you know, our bones, they're, they're like our skin. They are constantly breaking down and regenerating. So we want to make sure when they're regenerating, they're regenerating to be strong and not brittle. So let's jump right on in for some tips to get some more healthier bones. So let's first talk about the rock star of the bone world. And everyone says you need to have more calcium, right? You need to add calcium. Calcium mix for stronger bones, right? You see those commercials, drink milk for stronger bones, right? But did you know that too much calcium can actually cause damage to your bones and can actually make them more brittle? So rather than overdosing on calcium supplement you know supplements like a lot of people are taking calcium supplements all the time it might be better to get some of that calcium through your greens like your kale maybe some of your dairy and there's no point in having calcium if you can't absorb it and that comes to vitamin d we talked about vitamin d on a few of our episodes and the importance of vitamin d and how you can the best way to get vitamin d is of course through the sun but without vitamin d guess what our bodies can absorb calcium and on top of calcium vitamin d magnesium and vitamin k comes into play which a lot of people are deficient in also so boosting these nutrients is definitely good for bone health and when it comes to the next thing is we need to get moving right get jiggy with it you know, constant movement is important for bone health. Jogging, walking, we want to do functional strength training exercises. Ideally ones that we give you full range of motion and some to have resistance. Those will help build stronger bones. So moving on to a big one that everyone's probably having a little bit of now without even knowing about and that's stress, right? Stress is literally making your bone shake inside its marrow. It's, it's so hard on our body. Stress doesn't just cause chronic inflammation in our bodies, but it can actually cause chronic inflammation and actually weaken our bones. So what can we do to lower stress? Well, you could be like us, take mini vacations. We just came back from Cancun. Or you can take in deep breathing or meditation, or one of our best things to relax, to chill out, to chillax, is watch some rom-coms. That's always a great way to de-stress, right? And next, strike a pose. Your posture is one of the most important and easiest things to do to improve your bone strength and your bone health. Right. I know back in the day, you know, and maybe it's still popular now, slouching seems so cool in high school, right? But guess what? As you get older, slouching is not cool. And guess what? When you straighten up, guess what? You look a lot more confident and it doesn't look like you're auditioning for what what's that show called? Um Hunchback and Notre Dame, Quasimodo. You don't want to look like Quasimodo, right? You want to be, you know, nice, upright, like Prince Charming. Who wants to be Quasimodo when you can be Prince Charming? Take it one day at a time. Do some exercise. Eat your veggies. Get some sun. And, you know, throw that pose. Strike your pose. Get that posture straight. And all these things is going to help with bone health. 
not only now, but as we get older, not only will we be taller, but we can look more confident as we age. Hello, we are Mutt and Meow's Rescue, a 501c3 nonprofit, foster based, no kill group. Mutt and Meow's Rescue pulls dogs and cats from surrounding shelters in the greater Houston area. We even pick up dogs and cats abandoned on the streets. Mutt and Meow's Rescue is foster based and rely on your donations to keep rescuing. To know more about us is to know more about our furry friends and help them find their forever homes. Come visit us at Mutt and Meow's Rescue on Facebook today and decide how you can make a difference. Welcome back to Chronically Healthy Lives. So the last few minutes, I keep thinking, what is my dirty little secret? Have you figured out what yours is? No, and if I did, I'm probably not going to tell you. <laughs> you know, you're not supposed to tell your loved ones. You're supposed to tell a close friend. Um, but no, I haven't figured it out yet. I'm sure I have one, you know, but maybe us guys bury it a little better. So, you know, definitely may have to talk to uh, Gretchen and dig a little deeper on that. <laughs> Well, I, I think she's right about how our parents and our grandparents influence us. There's all it's a lot of the expectations from our parents that, you know, they, they tell you you should be something because you know, my dad's an architect and you should be an architect and you should be good at building things and I no, I'm not. And you know, they 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 say you know, you, you should be good in sciences and apparently I'm not that either. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it, it's and so I true. I pretend to be. I mean, I have a degree in it, but I'm not actually that good in it. I, I was not very good listening to my parents because I broke almost everything they wanted me to do, like find a nine-to-five job and uh, marry someone successful. Well, hey, I did that, so. Yeah, I don't know about successful. <laughs> well, next week we have a dear friend as our guest with us. So join us next week. We have Tanya Jones. Um, she's amazing. And uh, definitely we're going to get a lot of uh, golden nuggets with her. So join us back here on Friday at 7 p.m. CST. You can watch past episodes at watch.e360tv.com in the Fatality TV network on our YouTube channel. And if you'd like to know more about what we do and how we can help you live a chronically healthy life, visit us on our webpage at chronicallyhealthylife.com. And if you have any questions, comments, suggestions about our show, you can comment on our Facebook page, Chronically Healthy Life, or email us at anything at chronicallyhealthylife.com. We'll see you next week. See you next week. Cross, your host for Mindful Mondays every Monday at 1 p.m. Central Time, where you can embark on a transformative journey of self-care and ultimate happiness. Tune in to the Voyage to Vitality channel on the Achieve TV network. Mindful Mondays with Laura Cross. Be there, be mindful, and join us on E360 TV.